Well, it has now been three days since 20-year-old Adam Lanza went on a shooting rampage at an elementary school. As the community of Newtown, Connecticut mourns the loss of its children, people elsewhere are wondering what they should tell their children about the devastating tragedy, whether they should try to shield them from it or try to explain the inexplicable. Joining us to discuss this tonight is an internationally renowned expert in adolescent mental health. Dr. Stan Kutcher is a psychiatrist at the IWK Health Center. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Why don't we begin, before we get into the debate of, of what to say and what not and how much you should say, is it even possible for parents to, to shield their children from this? Well, this is a kind of story that is just incomprehensible for all of us. Whether it's uh, a parent, I'm a parent, mm -hmm. whether it's a school teacher, whether it's a professional like myself, these, these are horrible tragedies. And I think recognizing that it is a tragedy, that in times of tragedy what we need to know are in facts, information, but information that helps us and not information that harms us. But with so many people talking about it, we're hearing today uh, sympathy cards being made in schools, schools sending home letters, letting parents know what policies are. What can come of parents who say, I'm going to try to shield my child so that they know nothing about well, you this? You can't shield your child. And, and mm -hmm. it would be silly to try to shield your child from this as it would be silly to try to shield your child from anything else in life that is important for them. Mm -hmm. I think what parents need to do is to recognize that their children will have concerns, that their children will have ideas, that their children will have concepts which may or may not be correct. They also have to be concerned and know that with the tremendous media coverage and the discussions everywhere, their children themselves might feel vulnerable or their children themselves may feel unsafe and insecure. They have to be able to respond to their child appropriately with that knowledge. How much do you think social media is playing in this when we see now children as young as 10 or maybe even younger having Facebook and Twitter accounts? They're getting information from there. Well, one of the difficulties we have with social media is that it's a brand new form of communication. You know, print media has been around since Gutenberg, mm -hmm. and it took us an awfully long time to get a reasonable handle on how to use print media effectively and how to use print media responsibly. Social media is totally brand new, mm -hmm. and it is not brand new in the way that print media came into place, which was authoritarian from the church down to the, the masses and then out, but social media is starting with everybody and then moving all over the place. So it's going to take us a while before we figure out how to actually use social media appropriately and responsibly. All right, so if you're a parent and you decide that talking to your child about this is the right thing to do, it's what you want to do, how do you go about beginning to explain this? What should you tell a child? I think the first thing you do is you sit down with your child and you say you've heard about this and ask them what they've heard. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing to do here is to listen to your child. Listen not only for what your child is telling you, but listen to what your child is feeling. And try to understand what your child is feeling. Then, once you do that, the parent really needs to acknowledge the child's fears or feelings or hopes or worries. And once they do that, the ch parent needs to be able to give the child clear, useful information in the context in which the child will understand it. And in your experience, what are some concerns that children might have with this kind of, of a situation that maybe adults aren't, aren't thinking of or wouldn't think to address? Well, it may come as a surprise to many people, but some children and many children may not have any concerns. Mm -hmm. It happened over there, they were shooting, it's just like it was on TV and on they go. And so we have to be very careful that one of the things that we don't do is we don't think that all kids are going to respond with horror and worry because there will be a lot of kids that don't. The second thing that we have to do is when the child is worried is to be able to ensure them that their worries are not founded. Yes, this happened. It was bad. You're safe. So those things are important. We have to be careful in that we don't jump to conclusions about what the young person is thinking. But how much detail should you go in as a parent? Should you, for example, just say this number of people have died or should you tell them how they died? That's why exactly it's important to ask your child first. Right. Because children will tell us how much detail they want. Children will tell us what they want to know. They'll tell us what they need to know. 
And we don't know what they need to know. We don't know what they want to know. So the first step in talking to any child is to find out what is it that they need to know and what is it that they want to know. How much does the child's age play in here? You wouldn't talk to a five-year-old the same way you would to oh, a ten-year-old? Absolutely not. And you will find that if you talk to a five-year-old, what they want and need to know, how they process that information will be quite different than a 12-year-old or a 15-year-old. The other thing is, is that with a 12-year-old and 15-year-old, much of their information processing, much of their discussions will happen with their peer group. They will come to their parent to get reassurance and advice. Whereas for the younger child, they will often come to their parent for support and assage of their worries. So it can be quite different depending on how old the child is. But the, <laughs> but the issue is always go where your child leads you. Ask them, listen to them, respond to them. Don't assume you know what they're thinking. Don't assume you know what they're feeling. But given that so much depends on the individual child, do you think that schools and school boards are right to be having class sessions of, of making sympathy cards and sending home letters to parents? When that happens, I ask myself, why is that happening? Is it happening because of a deep understanding of what children need to know and process? Or is ha that happening because of what an adult thinks the child needs to know and process, or is that happening because of the adult's own need to process and act? And when we start to ask those questions, sometimes those activities don't make as much sense hmm. as they might otherwise. So you don't think they should be doing those kind of activities? I'm not sure hmm. what those activities end up doing for the children. Well, let me ask you this. What do you think schools should be doing? I think schools should be giving the information that this happened, this happened a long way away, that this school is a safe place, and ask the children to discuss this with their parents, because that's the people that the children need to discuss it with. The other thing that I think schools could do is that they could have a time after school, during lunch hour, in which children who want to talk about it with a teacher that they trust could come and talk to the teacher that they trust. Not forcing kids to do activities, but being there for kids who want to discuss it. They may find that many of the kids actually don't want to discuss it. Well, it's certainly a difficult subject to discuss. We appreciate your time tonight. It's a very, very difficult sub subject and a real tragedy. Mm -hmm. We'll continue to follow it, of course. Dr. Dan, Dr. Stan Kutcher with us tonight. We'll be right back.